Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you're all well. Your energy, I hope that's, that's high. We continue, ladies and gentlemen, for the second pillar that is holding the travel and tourism sector together. Quite literally, it is us people. Now, travel is an enabler for enhanced livelihoods. In fact, the sector accounted for over 330 million jobs in 2019. Incredible. 126 million new jobs are expected to be created by the travel and tourism sector in the coming decade. Now, we have got an amazing lineup here on this next panel. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator and and panel. They'll be looking at the potential to enrich communities through the development of tourism in lesser known destinations and the importance of urban planning to ensure that uh, destinations are not solely great places to visit but also great places to live in. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to the stage uh, a friend and dear colleague. We used to live together in Bahrain, here in, in the Gulf. S CNN's Hadley Gamble and her panel. And her panel are, I'm going to go introduce our dear panel. Fantastic. We have Her Excellency Cristina Garcia Frasco, Secretary of Tourism of the Philippines. Welcome to you, Your Excellency. His Excellency Vasilis Kikilias, Minister of Tourism from Greece, welcome to you. And Manfredi Lefebvre, Chairman of Abercrombie and Kent, welcome to you. Gibran Chapur, Executive Vice President of Palace Resorts, welcome. The stage is yours. Enjoy. Over to you. everybody. Once again, my name is Hadley Gamble. I'm CNBC's senior international correspondent and anchor here in the region, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of my panelists to the stage. This is an exciting opportunity, I think, to talk about not only the global sustainability goals and what that means for business leaders, and particularly the travel sector, but also what this actually means for job growth. At CNBC, we look at markets, we look at numbers, and frankly, we look at money, but also how that impacts the world. And at this point, we are talking so often about inflation, recession, and fears about the global economy. It will be very exciting, I think, to hear from these panelists in terms of how they see this impacting not only job growth and people at home, but also communities and the sustainability there. I want to kick off with um, a question to His Excellency, Vasilis Kikilius. Um, when you think about what happens next within the travel and tourism sector, obviously, Greece is putting a lot of effort, a lot of money, and a lot of strength behind their tourism sector. How do you see it evolving in a way that actually benefits the community? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, we are in Greece in the top five uh, touristic brands globally, and 25% of our GDP directly or indirectly it comes out of tourism. So it's incredible uh, the, the amount of energy, job opportunities, and investments in the sector. So yes in branded destinations, but mainly, as you said, in alternative destinations. We want to mix and blend with the local communities. I think the way that we have invested through the RRF in the infrastructures, waste disposal, use of water, uh, ban of plastic, birth allocation in, in the cruising industry and working with the cruising industry, and of course, resorts and hotels, and, and, and of course, uh, renewable energy, green and blue economy, Eco Islands, the Greco Islands. So let's give you an actual example. Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Prime Minister, initiated a program with Astipalea and Halki and Simi, very, very small islands in the Aegean, where we totally shifted the picture and they will be under renewable energy. So from the fire extinguisher to the police car to the municipality offices, but actually the private sector also, the houses, and the need for energy will come from renewable sources. So this is a great approach 
towards a green and blue economy, of course, to low carbon emissions and to helping the environment. It's a mandate that we're giving to the next generations and the next phase of, of tourism. We deeply want to invest in that. We communicate that with the National Organization of Tourism. Our campaign is going to be such. And of course, blending in with the local community means having people gain from the touristic sector so they're with us, they, they, they shape up policies, they're happy about it, and the Greek philoxenia, eh? they treat foreigners, they treat travelers in the best possible way. Yeah, we're just days away, as all of you know, from an implementation of a ban on Russian oil uh, in Europe. They're working on a ban of Russian gas in total in Europe. How challenging does it make your job in that sense? Because obviously you're looking to be much more equal friendly, but you at the same time got to combat higher energy prices across the board and that impacts folks at home. Uh, that, that's very challenging. And of course, these last three years, starting with the pandemic, global crisis of public health, then a war in the heart of Europe, double digit of inflation, energy crisis, unstable environment, but we're fighters and we're determined to push forward. So yes, we're supporting the private sector and we're supporting uh, the, the touristic sector. More than 44 billion euro was spent within the pandemic to support the economy and the social, uh, uh, of course, uh, framework in Greece. And now more than 12 billion euro, euro because of the energy crisis to support uh, individuals and support the industry. And we're going to keep on doing it. But yes, eventually we will pass to the next phase. And the next phase has to do with uh, renewable energy, solar energy, wind energy, uh, offshore uh, uh, investments in terms of uh, energy, uh, which, which is maybe uh, uh, solar parks within the uh, you know, premises that's not going to be touristic, but will help us adapt to what we produce in terms of renewable energy and then, uh, come on, we all live in one planet. We cherish our planet, we love our countries, but we love the planet and we want our children to have a chance of experiencing the unique experience that we offer in Greece, in Saudi Arabia and all over the world. I think it's worth a try. And I think that finally, with difficulties, we will succeed in that. Minister Fosco, uh, the Philippines hosts some of the world's most incredible resorts and they're very, very expensive. When you think about how that translates into the local communities, what is the government doing to make a way for folks at home in those communities to really benefit from all of that exorbitant wealth that is frankly visiting the Philippines? Well, first of all, the inherent advantage of the Philippines is that it has 7,641 islands across our beautiful archipelago that is a host to many accommodation sectors and resorts, not just the expensive ones, but the affordable ones as well. And what we have been trying to do is to equalize tourism promotion and development by continuing to develop our key destinations such as Cebu, Palawan, and Boracay on one hand, while giving an opportunity for lesser known destinations to come to the fore and uh, to be developed and lent with the expertise of the Department of Tourism and its attached agencies. I was a mayor of a local government unit prior to becoming Secretary of Tourism this year, and therefore, I have a full appreciation of how important it is to work with our local communities in the development and preservation of destinations. It's imperative to work with mayors, with governors, with district representatives, with community leaders, so that theories about sustainability have a chance at actual implementation. We have recently launched a program called the Philippine Experience, a heritage, culture, and arts caravan that will take us through the Philippine 16 regions, wherein we will conduct heritage mapping, culture mapping, product mapping, as well as uh, discuss with local communities imperative and important sustainability practices that they can adopt in their tourist destinations. We're also in the process of incentivizing sustainability and green practices by way of revising our national accreditation standards for tourist destinations. And therefore, it's a whole of government and whole of country approach as far as uh, implementing sustainable practices in our communities. What's your message to those who want to come as private equity, as investors, as folks who want to put a, a hotel or a resort in the Philippines. What is your message to them in terms of the local communities and their inherent responsibility to the people who live there? Well, the Philippines is open and ready 
for both tourists and investors. Our president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has identified tourism as a priority under his administration. And this means that any investor that will come to the Philippines can expect the full and unequivocal support of government to ensure ease of doing business, incentives for investments, and the full cooperation of local government units that they may encounter when they put up the destination. Very important to us is, of course, the best ambassadors of the Philippines, the Filipino people. And one, for me, one of the best reasons why you should invest in the Philippines is that the Filipino hospitality is distinct around the world. It's felt wherever you may go, as we are in the accommodation and services sector, in many sectors of the tourism industry. We have demonstrated this even here in Saudi Arabia, where there are over 800,000 Filipino workers. Mm -hmm. And therefore, should investors be interested in coming to the Philippines, they can expect that their businesses will surely flourish and will have repeat customers because the people that will populate these accommodation establishments are Filipino people with a distinct ability to convey the Filipino brand of service to all our guests. One other country that's, a, one other country that's obviously quite known for um, its hospitality of, is Egypt. And Manfredi, when you think about the tourism sector in your country, you have faced over even just the two decades that I've been covering the region, multiple different challenges, whether it be the Arab Spring, whether it be terrorism, whether it be the pandemic. When you look at what is happening in the world today, are you positive about tourism growth, particularly in Egypt? Or do you just have to be? I'm Italian. <laughs> but I have a big business in, 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 in Egypt. No, I'm, I'm, by nature, I'm a positive, so in general. And how can you not be in tourism when you see such a fast recovery? Mm. So it's, Egypt has been absolutely booming. I get calls all the time for people that want to have a cabin or charter a boat because it's, it's, a, it's a top demand. <clears throat> so in general, Egypt is, uh, but Africa in general also is extremely, because in, a lot of people want to go in remote destinations. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have been stuck in cities or stuck in, uh, uh, in their homes even, and now they want to go in the middle of the countryside, the wilderness, animal life, nature. I was lucky because Greece was fantastic, and I passed my summers in Greece on a, uh, on, on a boat, on a sailing boat, so I could do that, but many people couldn't. Many Americans could go in Chapur's resorts, so that he was also happy, but the world has been stuck. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's pent up demand, as you say, no? Yeah. Then in my sector, which is affluent, people are saying 60, 70% of the, uh, the people spend is money for enjoyment of life experiences. But would you say it's recession proof? It's quite, it's proving for the time being recession proof. Um, and it's even better, it is stock exchange proof. There was always a correlation between the prices uh, the value of the shares on the stock exchange and the willingness of uh, um, wealthy people to spend. Because maybe many of them were retired people who had put their savings in uh, stocks. Now it's totally dislinked. Yeah. Shares go down, travel consumption goes up, um, rates go up. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's when you think about that, I and mean, just to specifically to the challenges that are coming for the industry, the last time I spoke with Bill Gates, he told me that we have another pandemic in the offing. He didn't give me dates, unfortunately, but he said there was one coming. What, in your mind, is the greatest challenge to the industry today? Is it preparing for that next pandemic? Is it working around issues of recession and inflation? Look, I mean, I started operating cruise ships in 86. Mm. So how many have you ever had? Not mentioned uh, the towers, no? No? Towers. That's geopolitics. It's happening again. Then we had uh, uh, the um, Lehman Brothers collapse. Financials. It's happened again. Uh, we have the pandemic. We've had the, the flu, the avian flu, the pig flu, all the time. It always recovered. I mean, it's a very, uh, it's an industry which is very strong at recovering. Of course, we could have seen the necessity to prepare 
broad capacity of uh, pr producing uh, vaccines and uh, uh, because we were unprepared. And the selfishness, we were discussing with the minister, the selfishness that the world proved in the last three years is amazing. Oh, first, we think, oh, we're very good at speaking, but when there's a problem, let's take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully, I think that this is what will change. <laughs> Less are, selfish. We said we are a global world. And, you know, if we want to, the other people, the people that are on countries which are less developed, that feel that we are in the same world, yeah. we have to be ready not to be selfish when the right moment comes. And blah, blah, blah. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 it's detestable, we can say. You know? Kelly, your industry has been perhaps maligned for many years as being one of the greatest polluters. Um, and when we talk about ecosystems and sustainability, Perhaps you'd like to share how the industry specifically has evolved from what we were even talking about five years ago. Thank you so much for the opportunity to answer that question because I think there are a great many misperceptions about the cruise industry. And in fact, what people should know about the cruise industry is that it's a leader in responsible tourism and maritime best practices. Uh, in fact, our industry has made a commitment to achieve net carbon zero cruising by 2030, which is an unbelievably ambitious target for everyone in the sector. Um, and I think it's because of leaders like Manfredi and Pierre Francesco Vago and uh, the many members who sit on CLIA's board of directors that have been leading the way in innovation, making multi-millions of dollars of investment in things like uh, the capability to use the transitional fuel of LNG. And these were decisions that were made five and ten years ago that are now starting to lead the way um, as we look at sustainable fuels as part of that path to net zero. But it's not just about the propulsion of a ship. It's also about the hospitality operation that happens and the circular economy that the cruise industry has been so good at executing, just the ability to recycle almost 100% of the waste that's on the ship in a responsible way. And it's also about the engagement with the communities on the shore. So it's beneficial for passengers because they have an extraordinary experience. We like to say that cruise is accessible, responsible, experiential, and together it's essential. But it's that people-to-people -people connection and the people-to-places connection and the sustainability message that is so dominant in the public discourse today is an area, whether it's destination stewardship or environmental sustainability, where the cruise ship operators and their partners in the ports and the destinations and all of the supply chain have been working together to really deliver a best-in-class sustainable experience. Just to follow on to that, obviously with your industry, you're very, um, frankly, susceptible to swings in prices. And obviously, CNBC, we cover energy markets. In your mind, how challenging are the next couple of years going to be for the cruise industry, for operators, for owners? Because we're talking about prices that have the potential to spike quite enormously. Right, and so as the trade association, we don't comment on that, but I will build on what Manfredi said before, which is the cruise industry has proven to be incredibly resilient. And I think you can expect because, and as we heard earlier today from our chairman, we have movable assets. There's a flexibility that I think you can see in crews that helps really surmount some of these challenges. But you see them moving, frankly, in a more eco-friendly way in terms oh. of sustainable fuels. That's the plan on the horizon. Um, it's not even the plan. It's being executed right now. Yeah. So the, um, we have terrific examples of uh, different ships that are trying different sources of propulsion, so fuels is part of it, but there are more creative innovations from uh, the paint that's on the ships and how that helps move them through the water, um, how it, how, you know, air filtration works, how advanced wastewater works. You know, our goal is for the cruise industry to be distinguished as a leader in environmental sustainability because they have been leading the way for so many years and because some of the ships are so visible yes. and because, um, you know, our, we're so transparent in the data, you can see kind of more of the work that we do. So as the spotlight comes on to environmental sustainability, I look forward to the cruise industry really being held up high as an example of what can be achieved when you have leadership like we do of the cruise industry to be able to make some of these very expensive but very good decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
if the local communities where we go with the cruise ships would be subject to the same controls and same standards as the cruise ships are subject to, it would be a much better world. It's, I mean, You've got to talk to these government officials. No, but, I mean, <laughs> the They've controls, been great partners. They're great partners. I mean, you have so many local communities which are not controlled. The sewers which go in the water, blah, blah, blah. No, so we are amazing. I'm sorry. So if you couldn't hear on this side, it was basically if everybody was susceptible to the same regulations that cruise ships were, you would see an entire private sector that was accelerating. And then we talk about what good partners you all have been to the private sector. Javon, talk to me a bit about the communities, because obviously when you're talking about resorts, you're talking about employment. In your mind, how much more can resorts like yours do to encourage the employment in the local community? Do you feel like that's done in a sustainable way? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to define sustainability as we see it. I think sustainability uh, has to be a balance between three things, environment, social impact, and the wallet of the investor. Because everybody speaks about green initiatives, but the investor will be looking at the, at the dollar in the bottom line. So there should be this balance between all of these three factors. Um, I'm not an expert in environment, but, but I believe that we do a very heavy work on social responsibility. We have 14,000 staff members in our company, and we're building projects that will employ more than 6,000 in, in the next three years. And those two projects are one in Dominican Republic, and the other one is in Turks and Caicos. And something that we're doing in Dominican Republic, because it's a very heavy employment um, hotel, more than 2,000 rooms for 1,000 staff members, is that we're building a city because there's a lack of infrastructure. Uh, because nowadays people get transported two hours to work and then two hours back to their homes. So imagine being a 20-year-old single mom who's going to be taking care of your kids. Mm -hmm. So something important that we're doing is we're building 2,000 rooms, but we're building 2,000 apartments for the people to be able to live for free with their families. Along with these 2,000 apartments, we're building schools, parks, shopping malls, because people don't want to be just going to work and then go back home. They want to enjoy their lives. And, and, and the hotels make so much money, at least my competitors do, um, that, that we need to be able, I wouldn't say to share the wealth, but to be able to generate the wealth, to be able to pay better to our staff members. And I can tell you this investment is quite substantial. Uh, it's going to be 20% more of our investment of the hotel. But in the end, I think we're going to make up that money really quickly because we're going to have less turnover, we're going to have better staff, we're going to have happy staff, and we're going to be able to charge more. So we're going to be able to make that money back. And in Turks and Caicos, which is an island, beautiful island, is paradise in, in the Caribbean. Uh, the, the premier, uh, Washington Misik, it's the first uh, defensor of, of linkages and how to spread the wealth with the people in Turks. So instead of bringing people from abroad to be a musician, there is talent in the island. So we should be hiring people from the island so the wealth could be spread all over with the, with the people. So that's the, the way we, we see um, how resorts, how hotels, ships and tourist companies could influence in the social uh, aspect in, in, in the destinations. And it is important to mention, and maybe it's not nice to hear, but I don't care, I, I just say it. We need to take care that tourism in, world ter uh, in third world countries uh, doesn't become very profitable for the owner and then modern slavery for the employees. So we need to take that in, in account, make that balance, and in the end, you'll make, uh, you'll make more money as, yeah. a, as a company. Yeah. And just out of, uh, out of business curiosity, in terms of the all-inclusive idea, is that going to see a boon in your mind over the next couple of years in a recession or inflationary environment? Well, um, it's going to have a boom. It has had a boom. If you see the amount of destinations that are becoming all-inclusive, 
uh, it's, it's growing. And I don't want to, uh, it's important not to confuse all-inclusive with cheap. Our all-inclusive resorts are $1,500 per night for two people. So that's not cheap at all. Um, actually, we're collecting the money, either they eat or not. So, so it's a good business model. Um, and I think that the people don't want to be, they're on vacations. They don't want to be feeling they're paying for this, paying for that. So, so we believe this is good. Uh, the all-inclusive model employs a lot of uh, staff members in a, in a hotel different to a European plan. And definitely, I think it, it, it will continue to grow, not in cities because people want to go out, uh, go to different restaurants. But if you're in, uh, in, in Cancun, in the Maldives, <laughs> you don't have much where to go and eat. In Cancun, yeah, but Maldives, for example, no. So, so yeah, it depends on the destination. But again, you have to take care of the staff, and the staff will take care of your company. Yeah. Uh, Minister Kikilius, um, just a few months ago, I had the chance to speak with your prime minister alongside a NATO summit. And our topic was not travel and tourism, but we did speak about jobs. How many jobs do you anticipate bringing to Greece as a result of your plans in the next year? In the next 10 years? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's very, very important to understand that there is a lack of, of, of people that want to work in the sector in, in Greece, Europe, and I think uh, globally. And this is something that we should take very, very seriously into account. Yes, it's creating job opportunities uh, by, by, by the thousands, hundreds of thousands. We, we anticipate may, maybe 50 to 100,000 job opportunities every year increasingly for the next uh, 10 years in Greece. The thing is how you, you reskill them, you upskill them, how do you respect them, their, their way of living, their, 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 their framework of, uh, of quality of life, because if they're happy, they're going to give it back to the, to the sector. Of course, traditionally, we're blending in with the local uh, communities in Greece, and many, many, many people work in, in the sector, but during the two years of the pandemic, I think it's, it was more than obvious to all of us that people, because of their dramatic change of their lives, rethink about their job. Now, the, many, many of them want to work from home. Others never came back to the sector. It, it, the, the, it's, a, it's a matter of great significance to, for us to have well-paid jobs. It doesn't always happen. So this is something that, uh, of course, leaders, but also the private sector should take into account, because I do believe that there should be a balance, a balance between the things we offer and, and the way we offer them, and the people that work in the sector are there, are our ambassadors towards travelers and, and tourists. Greek hospitality is famous from, from the ancient times and, until today. We want to preserve that, and this is the spirit of tourism. It's a state of mind, it's the, the ability and the essence of taking your family or your friends and, and traveling somewhere where you feel nice and you feel at home. This is what we uh, serve and this is what we want to preserve. So essentially you're saying that you're, you're definitely going to be creating the jobs, but you're worried slightly about the sustainability in the sense that people will want to take them. There's a lack, there's a lack of, of, of that in Europe and, and, and Greece and the world now, nowadays. And once again, it will have to do with quality. Of course, paying them the, uh, you know, wages that are, uh, you know, of course, so, so they can preserve their way of, uh, of living. And uh, yes, uh, I think that it's very, very important to be able to uh, reskill them and, and upskill them. So education plays a, a bigger and even bigger role every year in terms of the industry. No doubt. Um, your Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but it was wonderful to have you on the panel. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you all. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, join me in thanking Hadley Gamble and her panel minister. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. All right, thank you. A round of applause, please, for Hadley Gamble and her panel. Thank you so much, thank you. All right, well, we continue. And diversity, equity, and inclusion are not only the right thing to do, but they are also good for 
business and more diverse businesses have proven to be more innovative. It really works. Now, more and more job seekers and employees are also considering a diverse workforce as a key factor when they go to evaluate that all-important job offer. So ensuring that our workforce represents society is critical, but also making sure that uh, people feel included and welcomed and can really thrive in the workforce is fundamental. And for the panel, included and supported, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage CNN's Eleni Jokas and her panel. Over to you, Eleni, thank you. A very good afternoon to everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic time. I certainly am. It has been incredible to hear all the insights, the passion, um, a lot of the data that is sort of going to be defining the next year in travel and tourism. And I have to say this again, I'm so delighted to be in Riyadh um, having these important conversations. We're going to be discussing inclusivity um, as well as job creation. It's a very broad theme but there's a lot to discuss. We've heard a little bit from the previous panelists about jobs within the sector. Are people getting paid enough? Do people still want to work in the sector post-pandemic? I think we've all sort of recalibrated and, and thought very differently about our lives and how do we create incentives for this very exciting industry. I'd like to welcome on stage my guest. I'm just gonna take a seat while I call everyone up. I'd like to welcome His Excellency Nayef Hamidi Mohammed Al Fayez. He is the Minister of Antiquities and Tourism for Jordan. Sir, welcome. You can come and take a seat. Uh, Desiree Bollier, uh, Chair and uh, Chief Merchant at Value Retail. Matthew Upchurch, Founder at Virtuoso. Chiara Corazza, member of Gender Equality Advisory Council for the G7. And we have Zubin uh, Karkaria. He's the founder and uh, CEO of VFS Global. A round of applause for my fantastic panelists this afternoon. Fantastic. Take a seat. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we all have a lot of experience after COVID struck. The demand destruction caused lots of small to medium-sized enterprises to fold. We saw many jobs in the hospitality industry completely upended. Airlines were grounded. I mean, the list, it, it goes on. We're sitting in a new reality where I, for one, have taken to the skies again, many people wanting to travel, whether it's business, whether it's leisure, and then we've seen massive gaps in the markets. There's been huge gaps in capacity and huge gaps in the jobs environment as well. We're going to be discussing these themes, plus importantly, inclusivity, what that looks like. I'm really interested in sort of exploring the value chain and how we can plug uh, into that. Your Excellency, great to have you with us. I'm sad to say I still have not been to Jordan but it's on my to-do list. <laughs> Good to have you on. Um, okay, um, Your Excellency, you know, Jordan is one of those exciting destinations, and in fact, you've seen fantastic numbers, specifically from the region, visitors coming, whether they're going to Petra or other incredible destinations. Could you give me a sense of what, how the numbers are changing the value chain, right? So are you seeing capacity? Do people want to work in the sector? And what does the jobs environment look like for you? Well, thank you very much for having us here. And uh, it's been an exciting day today, hearing from all different experts and uh, from both the public and private sector. And I think this is extremely important to hear and share the knowledge. Um, you know, it's been an exciting time for us. Can you just speak Am up I... a little? Yeah. There we go, try again. Okay, we'll try now. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 been, it's been an exciting uh, couple of years. After we have saw uh, an increase of number of arrivals to our country, and we were expecting more and more over the coming years, yeah. we faced with, with the pandemic, like the rest of the world. And this is where the shock came in. Everyone suffered. 
not only those uh, who are the big players in the industry, but all the value chain around us. But uh, if I look at it from one uh, positive uh, point of view, that gave or draw the attention to the importance of tourism, not only to, the, to those who are working in the tourism industry, but to the whole uh, other entities that are supporting Can this. You not hear? Okay. You cannot hear me. I think uh, take I, off your I, mic and then just do a handheld like this. Can I? Yeah, I think do that's this? Very good. Maybe that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, quickly. Yeah. Uh, as we were recovering uh, after the pandemic, or after, as we suffered because of the pandemic, we saw a good recovery in the last seven, eight months, and that gave us uh, hope of bringing back tourism. But not forgetting those who have suffered most, uh, uh, the value chain of tourism is not limited to those who are working directly in the tourism industry. It is also involving a lot of people. And most importantly, I think, are the local communities that are dependent on, on tourism. Uh, as we were talking to our colleagues before we walked in, talking about the importance of involving those local communities, not only involving them in terms of taking some of their services, but giving back to them and having them also be part of this value chain, not the big players as we sat down today and we heard some of those big players talking about the, the progress and how they are going to be moving on. Positive messages came out of those um, uh, talks in the last uh, few hours, take, take in, talking about how we need to take care of the employees, but it's not only the employees who are working directly with you, it is important to look at the people who are around you, who are supporting you uh, in the value chain in different areas. Uh, things are, as I said, looking positive, but we have to be cautious and careful. We don't want to lose more people from the industry. Uh, we saw a lot of people who left the industry who are refusing today to come back. We saw those because who Because of have the working conditions? They don't want to come back because of the working conditions? Not because of the working conditions. Part of it could be because of Pay? the working conditions, but some of them saw the risk that they had to take. Yeah. Uh, especially those who, who, who have invested everything. Uh, we know in, in, in our part of the world, we know, we know a lot of people by their, 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 their first uh, child. So a lot of local communities have uh, uh, been known. You go and visit a local experience of so-and-so, the, the mother of so-and-so. Uh, those small businesses that they have invested everything they have mm -hmm. during the pandemic, they lost their businesses. Yeah. They were not able to g regain back their businesses because they were not uh, tools to support them. Yeah. The difference between someone who is an empl employed in, 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 in uh, an institution, he was able to take care of his employees and maintain them. They were not. Yeah. You lost them. So bringing them back, and this is part of the experience that we were talking about throughout the sessions, the different sessions. Those people bringing them back, this is the challenge today. Yes. How do I convince someone who has invested a small amount, and these are SMEs, small amount of money, but this is everything what he has. He has lost it during the pandemic. He was not able to get the support, and now it's important to bring him back and convince him, no, tourism will pay back. It will pay back, but when it came down to it, no one was there to support him, and that is, that is the important part of this. And Chiara, I want to bring you in here. Um, women were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, specifically on the small to, enter small to medium enterprises uh, side of things. Um, women impacted quite significantly because of the demand destruction. Where are we right now? How would you define the space? Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here in Saudi. And I think it's a really the real place to talk about to inclusion, to, to talk about inclusion and diversity, and of course, of sustainability. We are facing a multi-crisis. We are talking about a pandemic, yes, but we are always an energetic, energetic crisis, climate change crisis, security crisis, food crisis, financial crisis, inflation. We have to rethink a completely different system of tourism, and this I've really learned. And I'm really deeply convinced that women that are disproportionately impacted, it's true, can bring a huge added value, a huge contribution to reinvent, to redefine this system. I cannot imagine that we don't have in mind that tourism is sustainable and inclusive or it's not. Because if we see the millenniums, the millenniums, they vote with their pockets. 
They want to go where they find what they expected. And if you don't think as the whole population thinks, that means women and men, you cannot feed the expectation of your customers, of your clients. I would just give you an, three numbers. First, if we had the equal representation of women and men in economic system from here to 2025, we would add a 28 trillion at the global GDP. It's a question of justice, but as you see, it's an economical issue. And in tourism, we have 55% of women involved as a workforce, but we have only 20% of women in management and only 8% in top management. Then the first thing is to have more women in governance, not because women are better than men, but because we bring a different perspective, we bring a different thinking, way of thinking. And again, when you know that 70%, 70% at least, of the decision where you go on vacation are taken by women, your wives, your, your girls, they decide where we go, which kind of hotel we choose, which kind of activity we're doing, and how much we're spending. Then we should maybe, when we propose packages, when we propose, have in mind this. And for governance, we have some issues. I, we have some solutions. What I do in the G7 and G20, I really work to change the environment because public and private have to work hand in hand. Private sector cannot do anything. Mm. We have to be together to achieve things. And laws has to be done by states. Yeah. Just uh, if you look at the countries that have quotas, uh, we have more than 25% of women in governance. All the countries that don't have quotas have less. Europe just 10 days ago decided by a decree that you have at least 30% of women in governance. It will yeah. change things because Listed companies, the big groups that here, will be obliged to promote equally men and women. The second issue, we just said it before, the, it's not create jobs. It, there are not enough people who want to work in hospitality. In Europe, we're faced with a great crisis after the COVID. Nobody wants more to have all the, how can I say, constraint. Uh, then we need women because we need to hire other kind of people. And we need to be attractive to them, then have flexible work, work-life balance, try to make it as secure and comfortable for them to work them. Yeah. And some big groups do that. Chia, thank you so much. We'll, we'll touch on those uh, issues in just a moment. I just want to bring Matthew in here. Um, and Matthew, during a recent uh, survey that Virtuoso um, conducted, it says that 74% of travelers, of your travelers on your platform. They're willing to pay more for travel sustainably um, if they know where their money is going. Could you break that number down for us? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, I, I do specialize in the luxury experiential sector. Yeah. And what's been happening is something called the commoditization of quality. As quality has become better and better overall, and the differential between quality products becomes less, more consumers and travelers are starting to choose the product based on something other than the base quality that they're going to get, like values, like show me, you know, show me what you're doing that's good. So th from that perspective. But on the, on the perspective of, you know, when, when we talk about sustainability, we started working on sustainability storytelling 15 years ago um, and telling the story, putting the spotlight. It's not just about the environment, it is about local economies. It's about the people. That's as much about sustainability. Okay. Sorry? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I'm, go I'm here, yeah. I'm back. <laughs> um, and people are asking those questions, saying what impact I'm going to have on the local economy? Yes. What <clears throat> are the people that I'm going to be engaged with? You know, do they work in a safe environment? So this is what's happening. So first, I, I just want to try to be as simple as possible yeah. and break it down real quick. First, as a private enterprise, we thought we were really good on D-E-I-E, D-E-I. We've added the word, the letter B. We think that adding B to D-E-I is super important because that is the ultimate human goal, is belonging. Everybody wants to belong. Our own employees and management team, whatever, we thought we were good at it. We have now added it as a defining objective in our playbook because it's not good enough. So we've, we've, we've really started to measure it, benchmark it, as a business, we feel that it does that. On the, I, there's no other industry, quite frankly, that has actually more diversity than the travel and tourism industry. 
The sector and why my particular passion is, we've heard it a lot over the last day and a half, the SME sector. So the SME sector already has more minorities, more women-owned businesses, whatever. And we as an industry need to do, and I'm very happy to say that, you know, as just being elected vice chair of membership of WTTC, we are looking at the initiatives of our responsibility of how to help the resiliency of the SME sector um, actually be there. It's our responsibility to do that because that's where a lot of the that's where a lot of the diversity lies. And when you talk about attractiveness, sometimes we talk about going to work for a big corporation, which is great. A lot of them are great, but a huge part of the of attractiveness of this is entrepreneurialism, yeah. right? And independence. Okay, thank you so much for that, um, Desiree. <laughs> great to have you with us. Um, you know, when we're talking about inclusivity, I have to, you know, you have to take a step back and look at the macro picture. Um, you know, Matthew focuses on the luxury segment, for example. Most countries tell us that they want to focus on quality tourists that, you know, are high end. What about creating a more inclusive environment where you're targeting a lot more people? You know, the, you know, the people that don't have that much to spend but really want to travel and then trying to capture a big, bigger part of the value chain. Why is it every time I travel and speak to tourism experts, ministers, they want to capture the higher end? Why is that, you know? I mean, obviously they're spending more, but that's not very inclusive. Okay, uh, you're saying three, four different things yeah. at the same time. Um, first of all, why? Because luxury does pay. Yeah. It's as simple as that, it's mathematical. Luxury is really actually the best return on investment, mm. right? It does not mean that it's not inclusive in its own way. Luxury really attracts a very, very diverse panel of people, but within a certain range of means, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think Matthew and um, the minister have alluded to two things, which are extremely important, SMEs. SMEs are really actually, travel is a tool of education for the young, right? Education is a very important part to start discovering cultures. And the youth, when they start traveling, it's a way for them to discover new cultures, new sense of belonging, new stories, new, actually, and they break down their entire prejudice. SME is where they're gonna go. These youth, exactly. right? These young people have a certain budget to travel with. And therefore, young actually entrepreneur in tourism that really have been bankrupt, it's sad to hear because they are the one who are gonna open their door for an entire generation discovering culture and travel within their own budget and means. And that's a way to be inclusive. And I really think I'm endorsing, and you know, Matthew's uh, mm, new initiative with WTTC, because if we could help these MS SMEs survive, thrive, we have a whole new young generation that could travel and start discovering the planet and break down the wall of prejudice. Brilliantly said. Brilliantly said. Um, Zubin, great to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> um, if anyone has ever applied for a visa, a, a, any kind of residency, anything to do with paperwork, you've probably done it through VFS. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here with the founder and CEO. Um, you know, it's, it's an incredible platform what you've been able to achieve. Um, you've definitely taken friction out of our lives and government's lives, um, I have to say. Um, what has your experience been, when I say inclusivity to you, what does that mean for you? Because I'm thinking skills development, because you've, you've got quite a technical platform. And I'm thinking the type of people you hire across the thousands of offices you have, and how does that plug into what we're talking on? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. You've been very kind with your words. Uh, I think I, I, I will start with uh, uh, something that the uh, Honorable Minister said uh, about what did we do during the pandemic you know, for our people. And I think something uh, that we realize that, yes, you need to look, look after them financially. Uh, that's an important part. Uh, but what did we do mentally for them? Because 
That's where the gap was. And what we did was across the 144 countries, over the last 24 months during the pandemic, we created around over 700 uh, modules of engagement, which were online engagement with the people. So just, you know, it could be on upskilling, uh, it could be something on cookery, it could be on anything, but just to keep them engaged and mentally, uh, what you call, uh, live in their minds, and uh, just to make them feel good about themselves even when they're sitting at home, you know, saying that, yes, this is going to end, um, you know, how is it going to uh, pan out? So just somebody to talk to. So this is something that we did. And when we talk about inclusiveness, you know, we have 126 nationalities uh, around uh, in 144 countries of the world. It's got, it's various ways that you look at inclusivity. It also looks at empowerment. How are you empowering your people? So inclusivity is not only diversity uh, or gender uh, equality. We have over 60%, I think you have more, 60% women in our organization. Uh, even in uh, Saudi Arabia, we have been there for, uh, two, from 2005, we have 800 staff, out of that 70% are Saudi nationals and 60% are women. Mm -hmm. So apart from gender diversity, apart from inclusiveness, what we also need to see is how we are empowering people how are we, you know, uh, you know, charting out their future careers in our, uh, in our, uh, what you call industry? I think they need some long-term initiatives, and uh, I, I would say these are the small, small areas that we need to look at. And uh, what I see in WTTC today, we have a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas. And if each one of us takes one and focuses on that, I think there will be a huge change. Um, Your Excellency, um, the Minister, I'd, I'd like to ask you this question. I think it's um, something that's on top of people's minds, especially when they travel to destinations that they not, you know, would normally go to. And the question has come up a lot lately, um, and uh, you'll you, you sort of resonate with what I'm about to say. What should the travel and tourism sector do to make people from different races, religions, genders, sexual orientations and with different disabilities feel welcome? Well, I think um, if you want to enter into tourism, you have to be welcoming to tourists. But at the others, on the other side, also tourists, when they go to, into a new culture, they have to be accommodating also in somehow, not only as uh, uh, what they expect, there has to be from both sides, uh, a sense of understanding to each other. I give you an example of Jordan. Some of the most wonderful experiences, by the way, are not made in the hotels or the resorts. Some of the best experiences are from people while they're wandering, going to a destination, and somehow they stop somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and they needed something. This is where they feel the welcoming of people. This is how people are treated. So when tourists come to a country, they're expecting to enjoy their experiences. But at the same time, I think it's a bridge between both, not only the tourists who come into the country, but also for the locals who are understanding what the tourist is all about. Uh, definitely, to, uh, the, the, the locals are, are looking for a return on, 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 on how much they can get out of this experience when people are coming spending in their countries. Um, I, again, I don't so I guess the question is, and I'm sorry to interject because we're running out of time. Mm. If I can't wear my shirt with a rainbow on it and I'm going to be asked to take it off, why should I choose to come to your destination? Well, again, I, I, I think... Uh, so I'm giving an example. I'm not saying Jordan in uh, particular. I'm saying generally, uh, hypothetically uh, speaking. Listen, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, you, you are wearing whatever you wear when you come to a country. But when I go to... Uh, to the beach, I'm expected to wear what I, I wear on yeah. the beach. When I go to a, a religious place, I'm expected to wear what I wear in, in that religious place. When I go to uh, 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 skiing, I'm expected to wear what I have to wear. Uh, it's not about a specific thing. Today, if you are wearing a, a, a rainbow shirt in a lot of countries, by the way, it doesn't mean anything to many people. Yeah. It's just an, a T-shirt, nice for, for them. They would not understand it. Uh, if you make a big fuss about it, then it becomes 
uh, an issue that could be not only in touristic places, anywhere in the world. You could yeah. stand in the middle of uh, Times Square and open that, and you'll have both, both views. So is it the right platform to, to discuss such things? You're not going there to discuss, you're going there to enjoy. No one is going to judge you for your religion, for your race, for your behavior. But at the same time, when you go there, you're expected to somehow be uh, catered to that place where you and go respectful, to. respectful, right, to the culture. Well, again, as I, I gave you the exa example. Uh, yeah. it's, it's when, when you go, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I went as a tourist to many places as a child. We used to wear shorts and we would enter to a church. They were, not, they were asking us politely to put yeah. something around us to be able to enter to, and I'm, I'm a male wearing short. I understand, I have to respect that. And again, once I go about, I, I, I wear my short again. And, it's and very continue. true. I mean, I was, I was asked to also cover my shoulders when I went to a, a yeah. church in Rome actually once. So, you know, and it happens all over the place. It's, it's about being respectful, like you say. One minute, okay, very quickly, each of you. <laughs> We're gonna speed through this. What are you expecting? Inclusivity, job creation. Um, let's start with you, Matthew. What do we expect, I'm sorry. Uh, inclusivity, job creation in the future, next, in the next year, what are the trends? Well, I think it's actually very simple. I, I feel that after the pandemic that we've been going through, there's gonna be a major bifurcation between those enterprises that really gate, gate employee engagement and people engagement right, and that includes inclusivity and belonging, and those who don't. And I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna see a, a real kind of polarization between those enterprises that get this right, whether you're a destination, a private enterprise, or whatever. Sure. I think that the, the World Travel Tourism Council could take as idea the supply chain. If you want to help entrepreneurs, women, small and medium businesses, public procurement and Private procurement could be a very powerful tool if you give them access. 242 million women own their businesses but have access to less than 1% of public and private procurement. In tourism, it's a great opportunity to do. And secondly, I would like that maybe we really put the, um, the input in STEM education. Here in, in, uh, you, t you told that here in, in Saudi, 80% of young women want to study engineers and they're already 60%. And this is the job of the future. If you want to make a nice position and contribute in, to, in the world travel or in other works, you need to have STEM education. And let's attract girls and women in that. Fantastic, Zubin. Very I think since we are in uh, uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and we have seen, you know, this has been like a buzzing place, like a beehive, I would say, you know, today. Uh, I, would, uh, I have already initiated two, two things that we are going to do. Um, we have spoken to Her Excellency, uh, sorry, Her Highness, about how will we help with the Trailblazers program, you know, what they're doing with 100,000 uh, uh, what they call Saudi nationals every year, that we could train and deploy them across 144 uh, countries in the world. And the other is, uh, for our Saudi uh, operations, we will train 100 Saudi nationals every year and also deploy them across the globe. So that's what, you know, it's an action item that I've taken uh, from WTTC here. Desiree. Strong culture, strong culture as an organization and really building that culture as a mindset in our entire organization so we could really do profit, but profit decently. Fantastic. And Your Excellency, Minister, and with you. Well, I definitely like to see a lot of our programs that we created for youth and women being uh, the uh, future uh, map of tourism, not only locally, but globally. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for my fantastic panelists. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you once again to Eleni and her panel. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking them once again. Thank you so much. Okay.